Welcome to Now in the 90s, where we look at the game releases of 30 years ago today. This week, the birth of Wario, an arcade classic comes home, and the return of the Lee Brothers. Hi, I'm your host, Jared, and today is November 4th, 1992. One of the best-selling Game Boy games of all time, released November 2nd, 1992, was Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins. Super Mario Land 2 sees Mario doing what Mario does best, running and jumping on enemies while grabbing some power-ups along the way. There are six zones with six bosses he needs to defeat to reclaim the six golden coins, allowing him to re-enter his castle, which has been stolen by the dastardly new villain, Wario. Gameplay is much closer to what people would expect from a Mario game. Super Mario Land 1 was weird. Koopas became bombs when they were jumped on. The Fire Flower gave Mario a bouncy ball attack. There were shoot 'em up levels. Almost as a response to that, Super Mario Land 2 is much more traditional and sought to play closer to the immensely popular Super Mario World. The character sprites were made much bigger, the fire flower shot fire balls, and now Mario could spin jump to destroy certain blocks below him. Without colors available on the Game Boy, some changes still had to be made. For example, a 1-Up mushroom looks exactly like a normal mushroom, so 1-Ups became hearts. And to signify that Mario has the fire flower power-up, instead of changing colors, he instead gets a feather in his hat. Or a stick? A flower stem? You know what? What is that? I could never actually tell. Also, all new was the carrot, giving Mario bunny ears, which he could flap to slow his descent, similar to the raccoon tail of Mario 3. A major gameplay innovation was that Super Mario Land 2 was non-linear. It had an overworld like Super Mario World, but the levels and zones could be completed in any order. You can go straight to Pumpkin Zone, fly out to Space Zone, or start with the ever-popular Mario Zone, where everything is toys. Super Mario Land 2, like the first one, had zero input from Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto. Instead, it was produced by Gunpei Yokoi, who is most known for his work on Metroid 2 Return of Samus and for essentially creating the Game Boy and the Virtual Boy. I love this one for my Game Boy. I didn't like the original Mario Land for how weird it was, so as a kid, it made me ecstatic that this game was more like a normal Mario game. Reviews at the time also loved it, with glowing scores across the board. With the exception of Nintendo Power, who rated it with only a 3.7 out of 5. They must have changed their minds though, because they still named it the best Game Boy game of 1992, and would eventually call Super Mario Land 2 the 7th best Game Boy game of all time. Of course, the most impactful thing Super Mario Land 2 ever did was create Wario. Be me, Wario. I am your master. Mario is your enemy. The wicked imposter Wario has cast an evil spell over Mario Land. Don't let Mario get the six golden coins. Don't let Mario reach the palace. This is the biggest, most dangerous, most challenging Game Boy adventure yet. Obey Wario. Destroy Mario. Don't fall under Wario's evil spell in Super Mario Land 2. Only on Game Boy. He made for a fascinating final boss at the time, as you had to face a boss using the exact same power-ups that Mario used. Somehow, Wario ended up proving so popular that a new game was created to focus on him. Wario Land, Super Mario Land 3 in 1994. Unsure of how well he'd do on his own, Nintendo kept the Super Mario Land subtitle just in case. His next game would actually be Wario Land for the Virtual Boy in 1995, and then Wario Land 2 for the Game Boy in 1998, with Wario Land 3 and 4 in the coming years, while also spitting himself off into the WarioWare game series beginning in 2003. Wario is now one of Nintendo's franchise characters able to stand on his own, all thanks to his villainous debut, in Super Mario Land 2. Another niche arcade game makes its way to homes. Also released was Super Buster Brothers for the Super Nintendo. Super Buster Brothers has you going through numerous levels armed with a harpoon gun, busting bouncing bubbles in every stage. Every time a bubble is popped, it splits into smaller ones, taking quick reactions and aiming to make them hit your shot. Power-ups can also be obtained, like getting a protective shield or a Vulcan gun. It comes with two game modes, Tour Mode, which has levels vaguely themed on locations around the world, and Panic Mode, which is essentially an endless survival mode. Super Buster Brothers is actually a sequel. The original was released by Capcom in the arcades in 1989 and was called Buster Brothers. In Europe, however, the game series is known as Pang, with the SNES title called Super Pang. I think the North American name is better. It also allowed us to get advertisements to say things like, the Buster Brothers 
are hunting balls and bagging profits. There was a major omission with the home release of Super Buster Brothers. The main characters, which have always been guys who look like archaeologists or explorers, were changed to two totally rad 90s kids with sunglasses on the cover. More importantly, despite having brothers in the title, the SNES game is only single player. It's Super Buster Brother. Just one. I still have a lot of fun with the game though. It scratches that same itch that a game like Arkanoid does. Super Buster Brothers would go on to get a sequel called Buster Buddies. However, it would not be seen in the West until the Buster Brothers collection for the PlayStation 1 in 1997. The series would then formally adopt the Pang name for all releases, starting with Mighty Pang in 2000, with the most recent entry in the series being Pang Adventures in 2016, and is still available for download on Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, and Nintendo Switch. Breaking free of arcade restraints, more kicks and punches abound. Released for the Super Nintendo in October 1992 was Super Double Dragon. Super Double Dragon is a side-scrolling beat-em-up starring the Double Dragon, Billy and Jimmy Lee. As enemies show up, you can punch, kick, grab, and throw them to take them out, sometimes picking up additional weapons to get to the end of several stages. Major changes for the series included all-new block and counter button. By pressing the button with a well-timed press, you can counter an enemy attack. You can also press and hold a button to charge up to do different special attacks, including their hurricane kick from Double Dragon 3. Super Double Dragon is fundamentally Double Dragon 4. However, for the first time, it isn't based on any arcade game. It's an original title developed with the intent of being just on the Super Nintendo. This also means the usual arcade cheapness isn't as prevalent. I actually really like this game. I liked using the counter button and the improved animations made it feel more like proper martial arts instead of street brawling. That said, it does feel pretty slow and sluggish when compared to the previous games. Super Double Dragon released in America first and is notably the worst version of Super Double Dragon. It was pretty much rushed to the market and had several things cut just to make it on time. Lead game designer Muneki Ibinuma detailed what they lost due to time constraints in 2004. For example, there were supposed to be cutscenes at the start and in between levels detailing the plot of the game. Instead, there are none whatsoever. So there is no context as to who you're fighting or why. Marion was supposed to appear as a police officer who assisted the Lee brothers in investigating whatever shadow organization. She's mentioned in the instruction manual, but does not show up in the game at all. Perhaps the worst is that when you defeat the final boss, it goes straight to credits. No cutscene, no victory music, just it's over. Many of these things were restored or remedied for the Japanese release of the game, now titled Return of Double Dragon. Other tweaks included being able to adjust the difficulty and Billy and Jimmy having different attack combos than each other. Also, when you throw a boomerang, you can catch it when it comes back. Whereas in the American Super Double Dragon, you hit yourself. And with everything else released around this time, here's Editor Dylan. The Super Scope is putting in some work for the SNES lately with Bazooka Blitzkrieg. Rather than the one-on-one -on -one deal we got with Battle Clash last week, it's an auto-scrolling gallery shooter that has you mowing down waves of robots. This game seems way slower paced and less exciting than Battle Clash as well, with its muted colors and less overall personality in the character designs. It's still enjoyable for what it is, I just preferred last week's offering. If you have the means to do so, give it a try and decide for yourself. The NES had Tecmo and NBA basketball, and before you get too excited, this is not another Tecmo Cup soccer game situation. There are no RPG elements, no random encounters, no level progression, or menu-based gameplay. Tecmo really tried their hardest to confuse us whenever we see the name Tecmo. You just never know what you're in for. Could be a sports game or an RPG. Talk about a Tecmo's deception, the last game this week was Black Bass Lure Fishing on the Game Boy. Game Pro mentioned it has 3D graphics that appear when you you're fighting a fish, and that's... That's just adorable. In the 90s, the term 3D was stretchier than Stretch Armstrong. That leaves us with a grand total of six games released on these three consoles this week in 1992. What do you think of when you hear the name Tecmo? Is it an old school game like Tecmo Bowl or Tecmo's Secret of the Stars? Or is it a more modern game without Tecmo in the title like Neo or Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball? <laughs> just kidding. Nobody wants to remember that game. Now Jared's gonna change the subject. Thanks Dylan. In the 
at Collector's Corner, having sold well over 10 million copies, Super Mario Land 2 isn't exactly hard to find. The game alone is worth about $20, and a complete version is only $80. Super Buster Brothers isn't too valuable either, with the game worth only $25, and a complete copy at about $57. Super Double Dragon is oddly the most valuable one this week. The cartridge alone is just over $40, and complete with the box and manual brings it to just shy of $150. And that's it for today. Next week, a hilarious Game Boy game, a looked over shoot 'em up, and a movie game from a galaxy far, far away. I'm your host, Jared, and this was now in the 90s. Thank you so much for watching Now in the 90s. Please like the video and leave a comment down below about any of the games this week and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you already are a subscriber, thank you so much. Super Mario Land 2 is definitely one of those games on the Game Boy that I played in the backseat of my parents' car at night, basically only getting to move for like two and a half seconds at a time every time a street lamp came by the window. 